Camera's off. I'll turn off my camera now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to all for logging on to tonight's session. Um, tonight we have a session by uh, Johnny Bradley about performance analysis. So performance analysis, why is it valuable? So this presentation will focus on the critical factors to make performance analysis such a crucial component of how teams prepare and coach their players. Johnny would also have a look at what the research tells us about Gaelic football and hurling in 2020 and take a deep dive into some games from last season to see what the analysis told us. So a little bit about Johnny himself. Johnny's a highly experienced performance analyst who has worked with elite teams from a range of sports across numerous major championships. He was performance analyst for the Sports Institute in Northern Ireland for 10 years before moving to work as a lecturer in sports performance analysis at, at IT Carlo in 2017. He has provided support to elite athletes from a wide range of sports, including hockey, triathlon, rugby union, Gaelic football, hurling, netball and swimming. So Johnny's session will be about 40 minutes tonight, 45 minutes, and we'll spend the last 15 to 20 minutes with a Q&A. So you might recall, for those of you who've been here before, that the Q&A button is on your screen. It's a little speech bubble with a question mark through it. So if you have a question for Johnny at any stage as we're going through the session, just click that, click that button, enter your question and hit send, and that will come to me and I'll be able to pass on any questions for Johnny. Okay, so Johnny, it's over to you. Peter, thank you very much, um, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, good evening, everybody, and, and also thank you for logging on this evening. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. As uh, Peter uh, was talking about there, tonight I'm going to talk, going to talk about what performance analysis is to me, why is it valuable, and how to get to that starting point and move on from there and actually do some analysis. So. So tonight I'm going to talk about what performance analysis is first, firstly, and then where to start, what the first steps are, what I feel is the very, very crucial step in, in, in terms of performance analysis. And then what I'm going to do is just look at some of the games from last year, the Lauren final replay last year with the footballers and the, the Lauren final of the hurlers as well. So what is performance analysis? To me, it's the official definition is performance analysis is an objective way of recording performance so that key elements of that performance can be quantified in a valid and consistent manner. So there is a slight perception out there that performance analysis is all about technology and it's all about money and all that there. It's actually not. You can do as much with a pen and paper at your game, whether it's a club game or inter county. But also, if you have a little bit of, um, you want to save a bit of time, you want to do more, there is so much technology out there. But the crucial thing to remember is the analyst is a driver of that. And whenever I was working with uh, the Sports Institute of Northern Ireland and different counties that I've worked with in the past, I felt that if I was doing my job really well, I could answer these two questions, no problem. So how good are our performances? So it's my job to answer that as an analyst. Like really, how are they in, in comparison to how we played? How are they in comparison? Who Who's the best? Uh, what does good look like? Who is the top of the tree? How far, how big is the gap? But also performance analysis allows the coaches and the players to understand, are we getting better? So where do we start in this journey? And I am very passionate about this first step because it is absolutely crucial. Uh, so we have, whenever we're work, as myself as an analyst, what I need the coach to be able to tell me is how they want the game to be played. Um, if the coaches can answer that really well, then I as an analyst have a really good understanding of what I have to measure. So. Uh, with our students in IT Carlo, I always say to them whenever they're doing their research project, you need to be able to tell me in two or three sentences, why are you doing this? And it's the same for coaches. You need to be able to communicate your principles of play. How do you want the game to be played? So that might be, this is how we're going to defend. This is how, these are important aspects of how we attack and how we transition um, from defense to attack or vice versa. And if the players can, you need to be, the challenge is how the coaches 
communicate that to the players, but also as an analyst. If I know the answer to this question from a coach, then I know this will define what I measure. So this is the very first, first step. So the principles of play, understanding what the coach's principles of play are, are so, so important. So, and also underpins that principles of play are the coach's philosophy. So the values of the coach, the identity, what his beliefs are, his behaviors, coupled with their principles of play and the environment that is created is essentially that kind of first starting point that, it, that an analyst needs. So, because this is the context in which a coach coaches, but also the context in which an analyst like myself supports and, and how that will be delivered. So these are kind of very, very important components I find. So it's not about going out and uh, picking all these KPIs or buying all this equipment. The essence of it is understanding A, what the coach is trying to do, how they believe the, the sport that they want to play, whether it's Camogie, Harlan, football. And as soon as the analysts know that, then we can define what we want to measure because that's the very, very first step. So what we want to be able to do is during the game is to provide information that allows them to impact the game. So again, it kind of comes back, to if we have tactics or we've got a plan or the coaches have the principles and how they attack and defend and we're measuring that, then we can monitor that during the game and say, okay, well, this is, this is, this is working, such and such isn't doing the job that we need them to do or we're doing really well here, we need to keep it going. And that makes a performance impact and ultimately that's what we strive to do. And then after the game, when all that's done, is about looking at the game and looking for insights. Did it go to plan? Did, what did we discuss at half time? Did that work? And then looking at the things that we measured that always links back to the coach's philosophy and principles of play and say, okay, we know this worked or this didn't. And we need to, that gives us a really good direction uh, in the following week at training. So if we look at that first step and we spend time trying to figure that out with the coaches and that can change throughout the season, that can change due to the journey that they're on or the opposition, the principles of play in terms of that game, but the coaches philosophy should be harnessed in that. And if you look at the two sports now and where they're at in 2020, I do find, if you even if you look at the, the games on TV, the old games, it's very much now that we're in the middle of a possession-based game. So possession is vital. It's about holding on to that possession, not letting it go, making sure we don't give that ball away and ultimately moving it through. So we are I'm talking about possess, more possession-based games, whereas in the past it might have been get the ball put up, up front as quickly as possible. So before we kind of get into it, I just want to make sure, and it's very important for analysts as well, that we make sure that our definitions are there and we under, and making sure that what a coach defines as a possession or what a coach defines as a tackle is what we're, what we're recording. So because they're possession-based games, I really do suggest that you track, I'm talking more from a team perspective, but tracking team possessions. So what is a team possession? So a team possession is me is for me is when somebody wins the ball in open play. So a goalkeeper holding the, the kick out or the goalkeeper holding the ball in the puck out, that to me isn't a team possession. I'm talking about team possessions here. So when they puck the ball out and the and temporary win possession, temporary I'm starting the team possession. So that's very important definition to have. And if we have Team, or if we track our team possessions during a the game, then we can look at this thing called productivity. So productivity to me is a really, real. it's probably the greatest in, indicator for me on how a team is actually playing, okay? So if we take those team possessions, the amount of team possessions we have, right? So for example, in the, the example here, we've got productivity is the total number of points that a team scores, points now, not scores, so points one, one seven would be 10 points, divided by the amount of team possessions they have. So it's not very complicated at all, but what that gives you is essentially how well you use your possession. Okay, so if we score, if we're lucky enough to score 24 points and we've had 
44 possessions. What we do then is we just multiply that by 10 to make it more tangible. And then we can say that we're scoring 5.45 points per 10 possessions, like 4.5.5 possessions or whatever. Some people go, what is this? But if, hopefully through the examples that I show later on, it will become useful because ultimately, again, I believe that so very much about possessions and teams work very, very hard. And especially now in Gaelic football, where you're getting possessions more or less from most of your kickers because they're mostly going short. This is very, very important. The other one that I'm really, really that I use a lot is turnover rate. And this is very simple again, using the, that team possession um, count that we're using. It's just how many times you transfer the, or lose possession. So give the ball away essentially. So if you look here, we've got 44 possessions, but we've give away all of those 44 possessions. We give away 18. We just multiply that by 100 and that gives us a turnover rate of 40, 41 percent. So that means geez, we give away 70 percent of our possession and the ability to track that, you know, how well we use possession and also how much we give away. Hopefully that will inform your coaching principles, your coaching philosophy, and how you're trying, how you want the game to be played. So it's moving away from, say, overall kicker percentage and attacks or turn, you know, so we're giving it more relative in terms of the ball we had and uh, it gives us a really good, ac uh, a better, a better view of the game from, for our, from my perspective. So um, if we just take a look at example, I'm going to go into Gaelic football here for a wee moment in time and maybe just focus on a little bit on the Gale and the Alarm final against the replay against Dublin versus Gary. So firstly, before we kind of go into that match, I just wanted to highlight some of the really good research that's out there in terms of Gaelic football. So this is a paper from uh, McGuckin et al. in 2020. This is Ben McGuckin from the IGA and he did the masters in, in Carlo and with him and Denise Martin and a few other authors, we looked at the entire championship in 2016. So we looked at every single possession. So that's over 6,000 possessions. The paper goes into a lot of detail about that and really some interesting findings. But one of the things we did was we benchmarked what winners do and what losers do. So you can see here from the entire football championship in 2016, we've got 59 games here and we looked at what was the average for winners and what was the average kind of for losers. So you can see here that Winners are hitting about 30 shots a game. They're hitting about that 20, 20 point mark. The attack creation, I'll talk about that in a moment, is up about 86%. That's essentially how many possessions get to the 45, opposition 45. Winners are hitting over the bar about 50, 58% in comparison to 50% of losers. Okay, so what this gives us is a really good benchmark for inter-county coaches to go, look, this is what we need to be hitting to win the game. Um, and we're looking here that for the for winners in 2016, they had a productivity of about 4.1. So that's, they're scoring four, ten, four points for every 10 possessions they have, where losers are only scoring 3.1. And then you can see then the turnover rate Winners are usually giving away 45% of their possessions, where losers are slightly higher. And one of the really interesting things as well is that we looked at every, Ben looked at every single possession and looked at how many passes there were. And he found that if he had less than four passes, they converted, of those uh, possessions that only had four passes or less, they got a shot off 50, 53% of the time. Whereas when they prolonged it and went to five to nine and maybe played about, made those opportunities a bit more, that increased. Okay, so that just, it's not as if, it's not like the old days where you get the ball and you one pass up the field and hope for the best. Now teams are starting to pass and you can see that. It might not be a good spectacle at times, but that's, that's the way the game has gone. And then, so this is 2016, so that's three, four years ago. Now, even from the analysis I did last year, we can see that this has increased. So in 2019, that productivity for winners is up to 4.7, where losers is at 3.5. So we've increased in, in, in both counts. So teams are using possession a lot more and getting a wee bit more from it, but also they've, they're not giving the ball away as much slightly down. So winners are 43% and losers are 47. 
So some of you might be just co club coaches and say, look, this is Inter County game. We also have um, a paper from Kevin McGuigan um, who did look at performance indicators at club level as well. So whenever Peter puts up these slides, you can click on that link and it takes you to the paper as well. So that's really, really good to know. I think that's brilliant for coaches to understand what that what what is required to win, what it takes to win, but also how does that link back to me as a coach? Okay, how does how do we get that attack creation up, or those shots up? And here's the benchmark we need to get. So we talked about that attack creation, and essentially what we're saying there is that we know, and even from looking at last year's games, the majority not all the games, but a good chunk of the latter stages of the championship that teams are winning possession here and they're getting to this point of the of the field, this 45 and getting past this point 90% of the time. Okay, so that's that tells us then that that's the way the game's going, that teams are getting back, they're getting back maybe and letting the teams get up here and putting that press on there. Whereas in the past, maybe that press was slightly out more towards the middle of the field. The data shows that teams are getting to this point 90% of the time, okay? So if you look at the all and final from last year, I think uh, replay, Kerry and Dublin, they're in the 90s. I think even Dublin were 95%, they won the possession, they got up to the 45. So that presents a new challenge in terms of coaches. Does your principles of how you attack, how you defend, how does that piece of information make you think about, oh, maybe we need to do some, maybe we need to do something quicker, maybe we need to deliver the ball in a different way, we need to look at the, who we're playing against. You know, those are the things. And this is this is about trying to pose questions like that. So if you look at the game, and if you look and you think back to the game, the yeah. first half it was 10-10. There wasn't much difference yeah. in the in the in the in from looking at the information that we were getting, the data. So like if you look at Dublin had hundred percent, they retained all their kickouts, Kerry did the same. Um Dublin had no ways, Kerry had three ways, they had uh, Dublin had 13 shots, so there wasn't much in it from that perspective. So then I thought, okay, then let's look at it from a different perspective. We know the scores, let's look at where they came from. So then we can look at, we have a slightly different picture. So we, we the score origin can be your own kickout, the opposition kickout, from a turnover or from a throw-in. So we can see here at Dublin in the first half, out of the 10 points, they got six points from their own kickouts. So I'm not here to tell you why that happened, but from a performance analyst, I can go, okay, that's interesting. Let's go back and look at the video. Because remember, for every figure I give you here, every six points here, I can go back and look at the, those six points in the video. And that's brilliant for a coach to go, okay, hey, we've got a bit of a direction here. Where do we want to go? So three points came from turnovers and one came from one point came from a throw-in. So that paints an, a, a picture there from a Dublin perspective. But from a Kerry perspective, obviously they didn't win any their Dublin kickouts, nor did Dublin. And even though they won 100% of their kickouts, they only scored three points from there. Okay, not shot. These are scores. But what they did do is they got seven points from turnovers. So forcing Dublin into to you know, good tackling or forcing them into a bad misplaced ball. So the question here is, okay, was it, from a coaching perspective, and I was an analyst for one of these teams, was that the plan? Okay, so we're not looking at the overall kicker percentage or anything like that. Sometimes that can tell you a story, but when it when it was tight and there wasn't much difference, then this is a really good way of looking at it. If you look at the second half, then it's quite a different picture. So we can see here then that Dublin scored a goal straight off, so Merchants go straight off from a throw-in. They didn't score as much from Dublin's kickouts, but they, they got six points from turnover. Then, okay, did the Kerry do something different? Did Dublin do something different? So I'm going to go and look at that. So and then let's look at, um, if we just look at uh, Kerry's second half performance, they only scored five points. Okay, they got one point from a Dublin kickout. And I was really interested by this. I was like, okay, geez, five points isn't a lot. You know, they scored 10, 10 points in the first half. What yeah. happened? Um, so again, uh, it's not for me to say, um, this isn't about, but uh, what this gives us is a really good, okay, this, this is interesting. Let's dive a little bit deeper. 
and then go in to um, look at, okay, let's look at the second half. So we can see Dublin here had 18 attacks, 15 shots, and nine scores. So there are 60% uh, conversion there, which is which is which is very good. Um, it's remember it's it's about what winners what it takes to win. Remember that 58%, 60%. But if you look at Kerry, then they only they had 16 shots, actually one shot more than Dublin. And they only converted five points. And to me, I'm like, okay, why is that the case? And if you look at the at the graphics here, so the the orange or the yet the white are points, the greens are goals, reds are whites, um, the orange is shorts. So then we can start to see from a carry perspective. Oh, geez, they had, and they're all inside the 45. Then I'm wondering, from an analyst and from a, maybe from a coaching perspective, who took those kicks? Were they under pressure? Did Dublin bring a man back? Or I'm just surmising here. But this, at least for me as an analyst, imagine Kerry had an hour game the next the, for next week. This is a really good way of going. Okay, this is something we need to work at. We need to have a conversation with uh, defense or the attacking midfielders or whatever, and maybe just look at who was getting on the ball at certain times. And I think even looking at it a little bit closely. That third quarter for, for, for Kerry, they had a lot of opportunities and probably just didn't take them. So, again, it's just taking that little bit of a deep dive in. Uh, this tells you the what, but doesn't tell you the why. And this is where performance analysis comes into its own, because remember, performance analysis is analysis on the actual performance. So, this is the what. It gives me that little bit of a an inkling, a little bit of direction to go in. Okay, I'm going to deep dive. I'm going to go in here and look at the video, trying to, and not just looking at the individual shots coming back right from when they won the kick out or they won that turnover. How much was there an unbalance? Did we rush it? Did we move? We're not getting the right boys in the right on the, in the right positions. I don't know. But also, what that does, it gives you direction for training. And I, I would love to think that if Kerry were playing the next game, or this could be a club match. They, this would give them really good direction for, for the week ahead. Okay, so that's just a little bit on Gaelic football. Now I thought I'd concentrate maybe on Hurling and in the 2019 Hurling final. So again, from Kilkenny and Tipperary. So if we look at it, what does the research tell us? So we have a fantastic piece of research from Colin Clear. You can see the link at the bottom. So he looked at the uh, performances in the 2015 championship and similar to Ben's, we looked at okay what does it take to win now it's, tw it's 2015 so we're talking about 27 games i think there's over 4,000 possessions analyzed and again look, what does it take to win so winners have about 38 shots losers have 30. the scoring efficiency for winners are around 62 percent losers are about 58 so there's not much there but ultimately shot winners are getting more shots off Shots from play, you can see there, efficiency from play um, is, is high. The dead balls are, you're, you're probably getting about nine a game, and the efficiency is about 73%. Uh, but I must, there's a caveat to that. This is taking in the entire championship. I would imagine if you get up to the latter stages of the championship, latter games of the championship, that's up at the 90s and 80s. And I think if you look at the semifinals and the finals from last year, the accuracy, I mean, you're talking about TJ Reid and these guys, it was up at 83%. So, um, freeze and hurling are, you know, are so, so important. You don't want to give them away either. Um, so, just a little bit on that. Um, and also, Colm looked at the passes again. And for, for hurling, whenever you pass, for all the possessions that had less than two passes, there was a 42% shot conversion. But when you look at it from a, from a possession that had about three to six, that conversion increased. And probably now, when you see the emergence of teams like Limerick using that short game a lot more, that's probably true in, in 2020 as well. So, and then what I did, Colm didn't look at productivity, but I looked at I have 21 games from the last year championship analyzed out of 29, and I looked at winners. So looking at what it, from a productivity perspective, how what does it take to win? So winners are scoring about four uh, four points for every 10 possessions, and losers are, are down about three. 
So last year's championship, that could have went up to about five. I think the lowest probably was about 1.9 um, at times. So a really, I'm telling you, this gives you a good indication from a team perspective how the game is going. Also, you can see there that in Hurling it's quite high. So that winners give away about 49s, nearly half their possessions. Just that's the nature of the game. And also losers are, are, are incredibly high. So we're probably up about 60% of their possessions. So for teams, how do, again, how does that affect the way you want to play from a, a coaching perspective? Um, does, it, does that come into play for your principles of play? Just think of that. So now that we've got that, what the research tells us, um, and there's not much in club hurling, unfortunately, uh, in the research. If just uh, just to clarify, I'm going to talk about pockets here, and just to clarify what a short pocket and a long pocket is. Uh, pocket is to me, and from talking to quite a number of guys in the Sunday game and stuff, that we we agreed last year when I was doing the stuff for the RTE, we agreed that short pocket is within the 45. So any pocket that was in, within the 45 meter line, we deemed that as a short pocket. Anything above the 45, that's a long pocket. So you can see there, hopefully. And if you really focus in on the long pocket, so the majority of the pockets are long. The From looking at the, the games last year that I analyzed, teams, the population are winning, the teams are retaining about 50% of those. So that's what we're looking at. And winners, it's 51, losers are about 40. So for a team that provide, that goes long, that's the kind of figure that we're looking at. So that's the average from the population. Okay. So go back to the Lauren final and if you look at Kilkenny. So this is Kilkenny's games up to the semi-final. So they started off with Dublin. So if you look at the, this is the percentage of long pockets that Kilkenny retained on the way to the final. So we can see here, we talked about 50% retention. We looked against Dublin, they were up at 57. Carlo, they went up to 58% of their long pockets. They won 54, 50 for Waxford. That was a draw. So they lost against Galway. They lost against Waxford. But there's, you know, Kilkenny are still winning those long pockets. And that's obviously a way of the way Brian Cody puts a lot of emphasis on. And I, before the Ireland final last year and just doing some prep for the final, I, I was looking at I, I, I thought, geez, this is really, really cool. This is really, Kilkenny are very, very, this is a strong part of their game. And then the final came and that went down to 34%. Okay. And then I was like, okay, uh, that's interesting. Let's look at Tipperary. How good were Tipperary? Tipperary must be very good at the long pockets. But then you look at it. So we game, we've got this benchmark of 50% of retaining your the long pockets. Cork, they only had 44 Waterford, they did really well. They got up to 63% of their long pockets. Clare went down to 44. Limerick, the first day when they won, even though they won the game well, they still only retained 40% of their long pockets. In the Munster final then, and they only retained 33% of their long pockets. And then Lease, Lease actually did really well against them from long pockets, for only 45. And then they slightly yeah. improved. But then you look at the yeah. Lauren final, they went way up to 66% of their long pockets. And to me, that's really, as an analyst, and just the way I think, I can write, tip, uh, tip must have done something there. Or that could be a tactic or, um, you know, what happened? So then I want to go in a little bit deeper. And then I remember, obviously, going through the game, the red card is obviously context. We want to put everything in context. So did the red card affect that? So let's look at Richie Hogan's red card was in the 32nd minute. Before the red card, Kilkenny were retaining about 50% of their long puckouts. I was like, oh, okay, that's on 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 song. So you're kind of nearly at half time there. But after that, after the red card, after the second half, they only retained 22% of their long puckouts. So that's that's okay, that's percentages. So then let's talk look at figures in, in a moment. I, I thought that was really interesting. And then let's go back to their source of score. Okay, remember, okay, so Kilkenny only won 22% of their pockets, flan pockets. Did, how did Tipperary do, uh, how many scores came off them? And if you look at Tipperary's source of score, okay, in the first half, 
they scored one nine. One two came from Kilkenny's puck out. So they did really well. They got a lot of lot of joy off that. They got four points from a turnover and three points from their own puck outs. So at that point, Kilkenny was still well in the game. Their productivity was 3.8. Tipperary's was uh, 3.9. And their turnover rate, Kil- Kilkenny, was about 44. So that, the only, that was kind of... It's kind of a typical performance, really. It was tight game. Tipperary went in a point up at that stage. Richie Hogan obviously was sent off. In the second half, then, then I'm looking, I'm like, okay. Tipperary scored 1 6 from Kilkenny Puckouts in the second half. They scored 1 7 from turnovers. So Kilkenny gave them the ball. And, and I was like, 1 7 is, is, is quite a lot. And if you look at the turnover rate for Kilkenny in the second half, Kilkenny gave away 73% of their possession in the second half. So their productivity went down to 2.3 and t- Tipperary's went up to around 4. So they used a lot of their ball well. Okay. If you look then at... So that's one... That's Tipperary scores and where they got joy out of it. Let's look at Kilkenny. So Kilkenny then, in the first half, had... They had 11 points. They only scored two points... From their own pockets. Remember, this is two points from uh, their own pockets. In the second half, they got nothing off their their own pockets. And if you remember, just a little bit of context, in the semi final, they had 37 pockets. Oh, sorry, in the final, they had 37 pockets and they retained only retained 29% of their own pockets. Against Limerick in the in the in the semi final, they retained 61% and they scored one six from Kilkenny Puckhouse. And actually in that first quarter, they scored 1-3 in the first quarter. So to me then, Tipperary had their homework done. They 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 really went after that long puck out of Kilkenny and nullified it and did a really good job. And that's just looking at the information, okay? But that's still, something was still in my head about the seven points um, you know, the, if I go back one slide, the 1 7 that, that Tipperary scored from the turnover, because that's that was interesting for me. So then I looked at Kilkenny in the third quarter of that game. And so that's 35 minutes to 55 minutes. And in that time, they had eight shots and they scored six times, so that's 75%. So that's pretty good. And this is where performance analysis can lie or can be misleading. So you're thinking, all right, 75% efficiency, that's brilliant, that's way above average. But then if you contextualize it a bit more and said they had 22 possessions. So 22 times they had the ball. So that's, and that conversion from 22 possessions to eight shots was only at 36%. And then I'm wondering, okay, what happened there? What happened? So they scored six times. What happened to the other, the other possessions? Well, they gave the ball away, the 16 turnovers. So that's 73% of the ball they had. So they had possession out in, the, out in the field and they gave it away. So just the context of it, in the first half, remember, there were a man down, the score at half time, there was a point in it. Um, so that's important to contextualize this information. So, but they had possession. So, in the third quarter, it wasn't so much about the long puckouts. It was about how much ball they gave away. And of those 16 turnovers in that third quarter, Tip scored 1-5. So I'm not going to show the videos because of the webinar and upload speeds, but have a look at the game again and look at that second half and see, as a coach, as a principles of play, what happened. Was that the plan? What was what was the rule? Or what type of ball were you supposed to deliver inside? Were we putting it to the space? I'm just putting things out there. But from going back to that one stat, looking at the run into Lauren final with Kilkenny and the long pockets and the run in from Tipperary as well, it's very, very interesting when you deep dive into it. And so you're getting beyond the just the general stuff and getting into the actual game flow and also, as a coach, so imagine we had, again, 
the scenario that Kilkenny were playing next week, how would this affect training? This could really give a clear direction for coaches, for 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 the trainers, you know, for the for, and to give really good direction on where they want to go. So again, it all comes back to how we want the game to be played. And all that information that I just showed you, if I was working with the team, it all had the feedback to this about the principles of play from the coach and the coaching philosophy. And I, as an analyst, I need to know that. Okay? So, because we perform on the match days and then we evaluate and then we adjust and prepare. So the green and the yellow and the red, then if you look up here, we do that at training, we do that at team meeting, meetings, and that's how you coach as well. So there are very important parts, but again, if, 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 you, if, if I'm talking to a coach and they don't say, oh, stats this, stats that, then why are they there? You, the coach is king, and the analyst and the coach relationship has to be very, very important, and it has to be, has to be very close. And an analyst needs to understand the principles of a play, and the coach needs to be able to communicate that clearly to analysts and also to players so that whenever you are in scenarios in training or in team meetings that you can always go back to this is the way we want the game to be played i hope that makes sense so just to kind of wrap up gaelic games are complex both codes okay they're, they're 15 players man's men are getting sent off or man injuries or different combinations and we have to understand that stats will not give you a definitive viewpoint. And that's fine. But what we do want and what I can give is that, and I really do not believe in paralysis by analysis. If you, as a coach, understand exactly the way you want to play and what's important for your team, you because you have this coaching and playing knowledge, your experience, the context, your A, you're at the game, what you see. And if performance analysis is information, objective information is there, that bit in the middle can help you. That's where the magic can happen. And I do believe that wholeheartedly. I understand for coaches, there's so much out there. GPS, physios, nutrition, psychology, performance analysis. But you need to be clear on what you want. Your coach is king and you're the, the captain of the ship. So for analysts, just, just to wrap up, analysts, stats don't measure everything, and that's all right. Accept it. Don't try and find stats that fit into everything. You need to be clear on that. Analysts, move beyond technology. It's not all about the cameras. It's not all about the software. You are running this. You are the most priceless commodity in this. You link everything to the coaching philosophy, the principles of play. And also be clear on what your job is. Swim in your own lane. Make sure that you have clarity on your role. You know your job tasks and make sure you do them well. Coaches, are you asking good enough questions of your analyst? And are you asking good enough questions of your players? Are you creating that learning environment that, that is so critical? Okay. Few other things. Be careful what you ask for. Performance analysis is very time consuming. You may say, Oh, I need every single possession, or I need, need to count every time somebody touched the possession or somebody bounced the ball. Be careful of that because that takes a lot of time. And whenever you have a game on a Sunday and you have another game on a Sunday, in between time, and these guys, most of them are got their own jobs as well. So be careful of what you ask for. Understand the demands and bring it back to this. Are you what you're asking for? Will you use it and will it make the boat go faster? Just final point, principles of play. If you look here here, and you look at hey behind and if you're looking at kickouts you, or pockets, you can get such a good view. If you've got principles on how you set up from a kickout from an opposition or for how to create space in your own kickouts or pockets, this view is what you need. And that's how you assess your principles of play. This view is hard. You can't get much from that to really assess how good your team is performing. And you may say, well, let's go park. We don't have that type of money in our county, or we don't have the facility for that or a club or whatever. 
This is uh, footage from uh, Ulster GEA Woman Nichols Sports Science Officer, and all he did was put a GoPro on a on a clamp and put it right behind the goals. So, for club teams, put that GoPro on a light or on your clubhouse and just let it run, get a good battery. You can buy a GoPro now for a couple of hundred quid. That will allow you as a coach to really harness a say movement of your forward line. So say for example, stats can't measure everything. So we can't measure hard runs. If hard running is so important, how you play the game and it's critical, well, we can't really measure that, but it's very important. This footage here can allow you as a coach to, uh, to assess it, to really look at how hard a forward is running or a defender, how close they're getting movement. Like if you're looking at Dublin kick or Donegal kickouts here and Patton's kickouts, this will give you a really good view of how Donegal set up. So let's just use it. And it's not very, very expensive. And uh, that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation. Peter will have the presentation uploaded and um, yeah, I'm on time. So Peter, I'm ready uh, for questions. Perfect, Johnny. Thanks very much for that. Um, the questions have flowed in from people, so I have a couple of them here just to get us started. I suppose one of the things historically about coaching is that it, obviously everybody's opinion is different and, and matters. So I know a number of us will be watching those slides and thinking, well, I watched the All-Ireland Final last year and I didn't see or notice those things. But analysis really can help us out of that world of opinion. Um, you know, and, and players can often, sometimes in club level, get a bad name as, you know, the, they're, they're lazy or they're whatever. And, and um, what's your sort of experience of, of helping coaches move from that opinion to some informed information? It's, um, it's, it's such a good question, Peter, because if you think about from a coaching perspective and you're at a game, especially at inter-county games, you know, the coach is the sideline, he's looking at the, or his own team, are they playing the way they want it? Um, he's looking at the other team, where did they line up, who's marking who, they've got the referee, they've got crowds, they've got all their members of the management team, They've got somebody throwing stats at them. So from a coaching perspective, it's it's such a demanding role at the game. And there is bias there. You see the game for your own eyes, but there is, you know, there's quite a lot of research based on actual uh, witness testimonies that coaches can only remember after the game a certain amount, maybe, you know, ranges from 40 to 60% of what the game is. And that's what performance analysis allows us to, to, to use it to, to kind of, Maybe after the game, look at it whenever the heart rate's down, looking at it contextually, using the, all this little pieces of information that kind of put it in black and white, and then you can deep dive into the, to, you know, the footage. If you've got high behind, you know, you are at the side of the pitch. You know, the, a coach is at the side of the pitch. If you've got the high behind, even watching it from the high behind, not even tagging anything. Even if you just watch the video from the high behind, you know, behind the goals, just gives you that different perspective. Then you can see, okay, like even in the Wexford uh, tip semi-final when, when Wexford went a man up, you know, did it go to plan there or the first day carry against Dublin or whatever. So performance analysis allows you to kind of, you know, objectify, give you objective information, but it also creates that forum to look at it and cool it the day. And if you as a coach understand your principles of play, how you want the game to, to, to be played, what the plan was, then this all can help. It's, it's to help the coaches. It's not, that, you know, sometimes it annoys me that performance analysis can get a bit of a bad name because it's trying to complicate it. it no, that's not what it, and if it is, then Either you're not asking the right questions, or we're, the analyst is overcomplicating it. You need to be you need to be in control of that ship. Um, a few, a couple of questions about maybe about your own role. Then, uh, like you mentioned, you work with a lot of sports, and and I suppose none of us are, are experts in so many sports as you have worked with. Uh, how much did you need to know, or, or you need to learn before you could really start with some of those sports? Yeah, it, it's it's such. I, I'm in in terms of Gaelic and Gaelic football. Like I played it, played it, I played for Derry. I played clubs who so kind of knew as a player the rule, and I worked with a lot of county teams. And I love Gaelic football. I love hurling. But when I was working in the institute, um, working with you know the likes of triathlon or swimming or hockey, 
I'm not coming from A, I'm not coming from that culture. Uh, I don't know the sport inside out. They use different language. So as an analyst, it was it's difficult. And it takes you a couple of years probably to get embedded. But what I did, whenever I was working with Irish hockey with the, with the men and the women, what I did was I went to every uh, coach meeting. I started to hear the interaction between the coaches and the players, see the learning environment, see how the coach communicated his principles to the players. Um, they just use like, and, uh, in, and, and what allowed me to do actually, Peter, was ask silly questions. So that, I, why do you just do it like that? Or why do you just hit the ball up there and then the players can come back? No, you can't do it like that, Johnny. You have to, and I got a better understanding of it. But, and then the biggest, the biggest uh, develop, uh, learning I got from working with hockey is that I was hooked up to the coach during the game. I wasn't speaking to him, but I could hear him. Then I could start to hear what he was talking about with his assistant coaches. I could start to hear how he was talking to players, even at quarters or at half time. Then that allowed me to go, well, yeah, what I'm doing is helping him communicate or see the game um, and allows him to make better decisions in terms of either we need to make a switch from a player or we need to play, we need to change the way we're playing here because what we planned is absolutely not working. So that's, yeah, it's a challenge, but it takes you a couple of years to get in there. And probably even in Gaelic, it probably takes, you know, a new management team a while to kind of get embedded to, for the players to understand, look, this is the way we're doing it. And like, uh, how we want the game to be played was taken from Eamon O'Shea. Simply, uh, um, that he communicated, if, that is fundamental for a coach to understand that. And it sounds simple, uh, but answer it. Some coaches don't really know the answer in terms of communicating that well to players or management team or analysts. So, how do you interact with the management team then? It takes. A, you know, I you have to have a really strong relationship. Um, you have to to understand where they're coming from. Um, you have to make understand how decisions are made, and you. The biggest thing I have done in the past with different coaches and managers is watch the game with them. Not at the not at the sideline, but you know, let's just watch the game. Then you can start to see how what he's looking for. It's a bit like looking on a at a at a website, right? Most of there's a lot of science about where play people watch or where the mouse goes to first on the screen. It usually goes top left, or if it's in there, it's top right. And that's the same for coaches when they watch. I'm like, what do you look, what do you look at there? And also what I do after a period of time is to put this information down and if I'm collecting, say, those, those, those metrics, those stats, and I put it down from them and I go, what do you look at? And I give them a red marker and, I, and he goes, yeah, I look at this. I says, what about that? Yellow card? I don't need to know that. Somebody else will tell me that. Or uh, I don't need to know tax anymore because the tax in Gaelic football, they don't tell you anything. So I don't need to know that either. So it's just having that ability to sit down with the coach, understand what he wants, and making sure that you're feeding him. Because without the coach, the analysts, you know, we need a coach. You know, that's essentially it. And um, for for you then, um, and in that relationship, what does half time look like? <laughs> half time is uh, is so critical, um, and it's a learning curve. Um, in the past, you know, being with different teams like Monaghan, Kildare, the pressure's on, you only have a, s a small amount of time. That's where the pen and paper at that time, whenever I was working with counties, was brain because you, you were in control of it. You take out that big web marker, you, you go, here's the key things, and you present that to the information to the coach. If he takes it and uses it, brilliant. If he doesn't, 100%. And analysts need to be, need to be, to be okay with that. Analysts need to be able to go, look, I've given the information to the coach, he's processing it. And you need to be careful then at half time as well, knowing what your job is there, what where the boundaries lies. You know, if you've got a good relationship with the coach or a good relationship with the team and you can talk to players, that's fine. But that all has to be agreed with the coaches as well. Um, but again, if I know what the plan was and what the tactics was, where and I, I know what the coach wants, way the game 
wanted them to play it. And if, if you have a conversation before half time, says, is everything OK? Then you should know the information that will help him make better decisions. But if things aren't going to play, then he he can ask you questions to go. Says, well, if we wanted, if our, say for example, you wanted to turn the ball over and your tackle count has to be high, then if that if that's what they want to look at, then that's fine. But your tackle count could be massively high, but you're not getting the scores on the board, and that's you know you need to be careful of that as well. And and then I'm thinking of of the example you gave there with the All Ireland final and red cards and so on either immediately before half time or immediately after half time. Um, have have you ever had situations where the uh, where the information you were going to give has completely changed by you know a red card or a goal scored or conceded just before half time? I, I remember we called the air playing Dublin and we got off to a brilliant start I think I can't remember the score it was a Leinster and we spent a lot of time before um, uh, with, with Kieran McGinney and Jason Ryan and things first 10 minutes were perfect and I think Michael Darren McCoy scored a goal and then okay things are going okay we'll stuck to the guns and then we were I was I was bringing clips down getting ready getting ready some information for the guys because I'm usually sitting beside one of the selectors or a number of them so we can kind of have a conversation with among ourselves what maybe you want to focus in on and then Dublin scored a goal last minute of the last minute of the first half and it kind of changed everything it changed the complexity in the game but you have to be able to react and that's where having good precise conversations at that time the language you use at half time the language you use with coaches that's where fighter pilots have a really good vocabulary you know from a, a, your dictionary is very concise very very to the point no waffle and that's the way you have to have to be at half time as an analyst bang 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 here's your three points not overload them with percentages this percentage is that understand what are the critical components of the performance and then that should hopefully help them have you know steer their conversation with the players at half time or have a you know better questions or I need to have a conversation with that player about this because of that or you know whatever maybe talk about the time then between games again like you, you said if Kilkenny had another another game or a replay or another uh, opportunity um, and you mentioned about the number of turnovers they had so talk about the, maybe that time between games and your role and, and how you might interact with coaches in doing that it's uh, it's the conversations after you know ultimately after games you have to put your level on out you, you're maybe looking into you're doing the team stuff you're looking at maybe putting another layer on top of that again just to make sure that the guys have good information that will make a difference then it's having a conversation it's making sure that there's a, a culture there of reflective practice with the management team looking back in that game um, even though it might be painful and i remember in hockey this was like in hockey we had four games a day we had not not team the, there was four games a day i had analyzed the four games Ireland could have been playing at 10 o'clock on the Thursday. That's there. I'm analysing that. I'm giving it back to the coaches there and then, all coded. They're taking it on. They're putting a layer on it. I'm still at the, at the ground analysing all our three because we're, the, the, we're playing the team at the end of the day at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock the next morning. So if you imagine that process, and I'm still doing the team stuff, I'm still doing that individual stuff, we have to debrief that game. We have to prep for the next game that night. It's done. It's done at that night. We have to debrief and then we have to prep. So we might debrief that night. That game's gone. You prep in the morning. So that taught me that once you get to the, you need to get that process done as quick as possible so it can inform Tuesday night. It's still in the player's memory or whenever the teams do it or they get together, quick as possible so they can cut that off and then you can that's the focus for the training whether it's drills or more game-based coaching that you know if you got that theme for that training session that hopefully the analysis will help the trainers the coaches to have that theme that runs through the week um and then you get to thursday you can do your opposition analysis when the back door was on and the for the when the back door is on and the, the championship it's a real tough time for analysts because you don't rest you don't necessarily know who you're going to be playing 
So you're analysing who you who the match was say yesterday, and then the draw comes and you're going right. I play Leitrim. I need to get three games, and then the then you lose sleep. Sleep deprived, Peter. That's what happens. <laughs> I don't think you should be looking for any sympathy with the access you get. Uh, <laughs> you won't be getting from any of our people here. For yeah. for people then that are that are with club teams, maybe even underage teams. What what can they do? What what would you suggest for those guys? I would definitely for club teams, um, say for senior club teams, just video the game. If you do nothing but video the games, that's that's a good start. Um, like it depends on where the coach is at. You know, try. You know, coaches need to use this tool and find a value in it. If you find a value in performance analysis, you'll get value from it. So at least video the games, have a record of it. You can put you, you, you there's software there that allows you to clip the games, um, put the timestamp the games. You can go back and look at clips, any any kick out. Like for me, I can go back from last season and look at any Kilkenny puck out I want, every single one. So like I didn't even go into you know all those stats. No, I didn't go into who they targeting. Is there any trends or tendencies of how they set up or anything like that? So. For a club team, just video the because it allows you to to review it in a in a controlled environment. You know when the shoulders are down, the heart rate's down, and look at it. And say, okay, we didn't play that bad, or geez, we I thought we didn't play as bad as that. And then for underage, that high behind. For underage, like I coached under fourteens a number of years ago, and I saw Andy more like we had a full forward who just couldn't visualize how I, I was trying to say, look, you need to move a lot right to left, make sure you lose the defender and try, because at that age, under 14, that's how they're developing. They're making decisions more, um, start to make better decisions. And I saw Andy Moore on the, on the, on the, on the Sunday game or on the RT, and I saw him from a high behind, just a replay or something, him making runs. And I recorded it and I showed it to the player and he just, he got it. He understood what I wanted him to do. So th those things are underage, just the wee, wee, wee clips that might just help them understand. Like, I'm not talking about stats or anything, just uh, allowing a, a young player to see it because we're all visual learners at the end of the day. I think something like that could really help. And you mentioned even on, on your presentation about notation analysis. Mm -hmm. um, um, can, is that just a, a handy way for coaches to start as well? I, I I am a big believer of hand notation. I think you know it, if you can utilize that well, it's as good as computer. The, the disadvantages is that you can't go back and ch double check, and you can't go back and look at the clips, which is critical for me. But I do a blend of both. Even though, even whenever I go in and tag all the kickouts and the shots from play and the turnovers, I'm still with my pen and paper notating who got it and writing my notes. So that at the end of the season, I can go back and look through it and all, uh, and all that from there. So definitely, I'd have to, you know, for club managers, think about who you're playing against, what the team you're, what the game is, what information do you need to make better decisions coming up to half time. If you've, imagine the blue sky, you're walking in, you're four points down, what do you need to know? Um, yeah. And that also linked back to your principal play. Definitely pen and paper to me is if you, it, it just helps you because, as I said in the present or earlier on, Peter, a coach is the, the demands. You know, coaches can't see everything, and they don't have this good. good everybody thinks that brand coaches can see everything and remember everything. Performance analysis allows them to, to, to you know, depend on that, um, and 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 use it to help them make better decisions. I'm thinking here. Some of the questions coming through are are almost saying that that. Coaches and analysts, the role is sort of becoming more blurred. Um, how much coaching knowledge do you need, or how much analysis knowledge does a coach need? Um, I, I can't. I don't. I wouldn't agree that is that is blurring. I think. Um, I think they're intertwined. I think they're embedded. I think the coach analyst relationship is very very important, as is a coach's. Coach manager or manager and different members of the backroom team is, is critical there. I think it helps. I think if you've got a management team, they're all hopefully agreed in the way they want to go. They 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 understand the way they want to coach. It all assists. 
And but you're right in terms of making sure that. The, but it's the the manager's responsibility to make sure that people know what their rules are. Like, I don't think managers need to be analysts, but I do think that managers the best setups. The coaches know how to. If I can, the, the way it worked with hockey was brilliant because I could give them uh, the game on a hard a USB and they could put it onto their laptop and they could shift through. They weren't analyzing, but they were putting another layer on top of it and it allowed, it, allowed the process to be more efficient because they're seeing the game again, they're seeing a new light. I mean, you know, if you're coming after that Kilkenny game or and looked at all the puck outs and you go, oh, we need to work on that or you know, or the carry with the wides or the, the blocks or where we're shooting from. Sure, if a coach can go and have that on a Monday night, isn't that not brilliant? And then come Tuesday, he's in England, and the analysts, you know, all our guys have a good indication of where they want to go with it. So, what do you think of analysis meetings then? You sometimes get, you know, uh, the stories of the two hour meetings and so on. Is, is there a good or a better way of doing those type of things? <laughs> And um, we didn't touch on feedback, and we could probably do an hour, two or three webinars on how to feedback. We're kind of more touching on the performance now. That is critical. And um, you know how, and again, we're talking about communication there, how we want the game to be played, but also reviewing is very, very important. And there's a lot of literature around now, uh, and research allows us to really fully understand that a lot better. I think. Um, the two-hour sessions, I just don't think they work um, because you could a lot of repetition. I think if you can be short and succinct, clearly communicate what happened or here's a reason why, and engage the players. It does, and then also, whenever you say have training camps or you have a little bit more less pressure, you can get the players involved in player-led sessions. So there's different ways of communicating that feedback. And let you know people, people don't. Uh, underestimate that these players know a lot about football too, or know a lot about hurling as well. And sometimes they can see things that maybe other people can't because they're playing the game or they have a different context to it, or they have a different outlook on it. So, 20 minutes usually best practice, but sometimes, uh, Peter, they go on because it might have been a really bad performance, and they just that needs to happen at that point of the season to get it all out there. Or they could be 10 minutes, just boom, 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 out the training session, you've got your gear on, out to the session. Because that's what we did, I remember in Monaghan, all the set, all the feedback stuff was right before uh, the training session. The guys came in, they were kitted out, boots on. We spent a good bit of time, 10, 15 minutes on the key points from the previous game, created that uh, learning environment, got feedback from them, a two-way process with the management team, the coaches and analysts, and then they went out. And then the trainers were able to go, this is the reason why we're doing this, because we've seen it in there. And that's, that's a really good learning environment. I'm a big fan of short, sharp, but it's, uh, the coaches at the end of the day is, is key to it, you know. And on match day then, how, how often or how frequently would you be in touch with, with the management team with, with any feedback or information that you have? Um, I wouldn't be invo uh, talking to the, the manager at all. The manager has enough to be worrying about that Johnny Bradley shortened down, shouting down, 55 percent you know this that and the other uh coaching teams i would recommend that the analysts is sitting beside one of the selectors up high you can get a better view of the game you can feed that and then they can maybe uh, communicate down to the manager or somebody is down the bench that can have a word in the ear that they know the manager well um yeah. because you don't want to overload the manager either with information because you know he's doing enough there so definitely what we do now have is kind of we can make dashboards on, you know, you know the way you've got your laptop, you can extend the screen and we can create dashboards that have the critical elements on there. Not everything, just say five or six different things and you can, you can and analysts or coaches can look at it and go, well, Jesus, that's, we, need, we need to change this. And then we can communicate that down to the manager and then they can make decisions there. So um, just a couple of more questions. In, in your experience, you know, ha have you ever been able to feed back data or information to coaches that has changed the the approach at halftime, for example? Um, yeah, I think so. I think when the, the um, that's the whole point, isn't it? Really, um, that's either you're 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 collecting information to say, yeah, this is working well, keep it going, or you're going, 
hey, we need to change something there. Somebody's struggling inside, um, or we need to we need to go longer here because we're getting more joy. Whenever we one possession out longer in those long puckers, we're we're getting goal chances. Or yeah, but that's the whole point. I think um, that's where you want to be, and that's why you're there. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, it's down to the manager. You can feed information in, but it's up to them to make those calls. But you'd like to think that you contribute to it, uh, to the decisions made at half time or during the game or whatever. And if there was just two, if if there were just two or three metrics that you would advise people to keep an eye on, what would they be? It depends. Like the game has evolved. That's what that's. I was kind of was alluding to in the in the presentation. Um, I, I do think the productivity is a really good gauge of how well teams are using the possession. Um, and the amount of ball they have, so that would be one I would think to, to, to look at. Obviously, you want to have your efficiencies up above uh, in terms of your shots to, to, to scores. Um, but like it, it all, it doesn't really matter. And all it comes back to is what will help the manager or the you know the public, or, you know whoever's using it to make you know. Obviously, you you run into a game, you've trained the way you've trained. You've got your principles of play that you've you've been homing in on. Your opposition is there. We might change it around because we're playing this type of opposition, and then we agree on that before we go in, and then they might change something else next week. So um, the productivity to me, turnover rate is just a much ball you're giving away. Turnovers, what area of the pitch you know you can look at. There's plenty. If you look at the links I gave in there, those papers, Kevin McGuigan's, uh, Colin Clears, De- uh, um, Ben McGuigan's. And at the bottom of my presentation, Peter, I put all the kind of Gaelic football hurling literature at there. I put it all in there so people can go and have a look at it as well. But they're all there. But again, it comes back to, to, to the coach and manager. Yeah, th- thanks, Johnny. And there was a couple of questions in about hurling and camogie uh, uh, equivalent pieces of research to Ben's and, and so on. And we're getting there, we're, we're, and Carlo, we're we've got uh, we're working on a few club hurling stuff, and also a hurling championship stuff. So hopefully in the next few while, um, that'll be more prevalent. But we're working hard on it. Yeah, if we get back playing as soon as we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, one one thing I would say, sorry, Peter, you just reminded me there. Um, this is a great time for coaches to really hone in on what those principles are, have those conversations with analysts, making sure that they're on the same page, and you know learning the game. I know Stuart talked about be a student of the game. Use use that time now to, to, to do that. Use your analyst as well. An analyst to to, to, to to do the same. Um a question here this it's anonymous but it must be a former student maybe um looking for advice on on getting more experience as an analyst and do you have to go abroad? Uh no, I don't think you have to go abroad. It depends what sport your your um you're operating on for like I think uh, GA now most kind of teams have analysis teams you they're always crying out for people to help out and get insight I think if you want a career in performance analysis you have to to, to put yourself out there the best guys um, really do are operating and I think it is important to say that we have a fantastic community of performance analysts in the GA the GA in particular have really got behind Denise Martin and creating a community of practice of analysts and we get together every year we talk about and we're very very open and we're very unique in that uh, uh, Peter and the fact that we are such a good community and that's because of the great work Denise Martin has done so we come together and if, uh, I would say if any uh, people who want to get into performance analysis just give Denise or myself an email you can come along we can get accredited even if you're just at a club level, you can get accredited by the GEA in terms of performance analysis. Like we have level fours who are operating at Ender County for at least three years, right down to level one. Like Denise has put a serious shift in there with the GEA in terms of trying to accredit it. The guys that are working in performance analysis. So I think now we've got about 130 credit analysts in the country, and we kind of have a great network. Like even the Ender County analysts have a have a WhatsApp group and they share footage and it's absolutely amazing. It's great. No, it is. And and for anyone listening, um, Johnny's your email is on your slides as far as I recall. Um, and and just drop Johnny a note on that. And it, it's a really, really good example of, of of practitioners sharing each other. When you think that, you know, 
the, the perception might be that they're the opposition and you hide everything from yeah. them. It's a really good example of how everyone can learn from each other. Absolutely, Peter. And, you know, let's not get away from the fact that we're we're looking at the same things, the kickouts, the pockets and all this. But every team is different because the coach has different principles and they're unique to that team and that culture and philosophy is there. And that's where analysis comes into this one. And we're very open on that. And that's, where we, that's the way we want it. We want to be, and I know the guys can share footage, and and that's brilliant. But it comes down to the coaches and the and that that culture that they're creating, and that's where the analysis is really unique, not the the KPIs that everybody looks at. Thanks, Johnny. Last question because we're way over time. Um, and th- thanks very much for staying. We could we could be on here for another hour easy. <laughs> what from the analysis perspective? Is there in, in looking into the future? Is there something that you cannot do now that you would like to be able to do, or something that that would be able to change or, or really add to the analysis in the next couple of years? I think it's what what kind of what we're presenting there is that kind of information of what it takes to win, and it's you know what we looked at like you know we're we're relying on individuals to collect information and students and research institutions to do that. I think I would love. We talk about Opta in England and with the soccer in terms of that the footage is there, it's analyzed and then it's made public. You know, something like that for the GEA would be amazing to facilitate, to allow your analysts to analyze, not code, um, to facilitate the inter-county analysts to be able to get any game they want. They have the basic codes and then they can start from that level and go into a little bit more detail rather than trying to source games try and get it in, analyze all the stuff for then putting spend on there. If we can reduce that time down so that coaches and teams are actually analyzing rather than uh, um, coding and, and bringing stuff there and sharing out. And also just a sharing platform for for, for to make team make it easier for teams to communicate with their players. I think now there's two things that are, that are at this moment in time how important are communication Video zooms or teams or whatever is such so important, but also if you see on social media visualizations of data and the, the, how they how that is commu- that's the new way of communicating now as well and it's seen as a general public to to take quite complex things and and put it in an infra- in a way that people can understand and that's part of my role with the Sunday game is this is not all about stats but it's informing the people there that allows yeah. them to. Make sure, a yes, it's hundred percent what, what is what is what is accurate, and it's up to them, the pundits and the managers and the coaches to communicate that in a way that their players can understand or the public can understand. And it's not about using stats; they don't even have to talk about stats, but at least they know, like, Kilkenny know how to, to work. Say, for example, on long pockets, or Kerry know how to look work out at shot selection or or shot creation, you know, things like that. Thanks, Johnny. Um, I think I think we'll bring this session to a close. Um, firstly, thanks so much to you for putting all the time and effort into this for the last number of weeks. Well, um, and, and we can do that this evening. Um, we, it's been a fantastic presentation and a great discussion. Um, and, and sincere thanks on behalf of everybody on the call this evening. Uh, for for everybody out there, just to let you know, we're we're back after the bank holiday weekend. We're back on Tuesday evening. And uh, we have a session with Dr. Shane Hill. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Shane is an associate professor at Flinders University in Australia. So I actually spoke to Shane this morning and, and we were recorded a session that we're going to show on Tuesday evening. And I have to say it, it's it's really a great one. It's not going it, it's one not to be missed. So Shane is going to talk about game centered approaches to, to sport. And he's going to give his experience um, in Australia. Australia uh, of, of those game centered approaches and how us as coaches can can really try and implement the, these. And I think um, I actually think from talking to, to, to Johnny now and Shane this morning that there is such um, a link between these two presentations that I think uh, after Tuesday night, I think everything will 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 be far more clearer across all of these things. And uh, I'd really advise anyone who wants to who, who wants to register to do so. So registration for that session is open now. Um, and and is available for everybody. And as previously, you make sure you, you add the correct email address, and we'll send the link directly to you via email on Tuesday next. So, 
Last thing is just to hope everybody enjoys the bank holiday weekend. And um, again, a sincere thanks to you, Johnny. No problem, Peter. Thank you.